Everybody, how's it going? So it's great to be here at Web Summit and with Player One, which is our first ever games oriented day. Who here is actually, we consider themselves from the game industry, just so I can kind of, excellent, welcome. Um, so it seems a big theme in Player One today has really been thinking about the future of games. And at Pro in Probable, we've really been uh, doing some hard thinking ourselves about where we think the game industry is going and what, kind of what's the vanishing point, not just 12 months or 24 months away, but you know, in the next like, 10 years, what are games going to turn into? And based upon that, we've been thinking as well about what's the nature of the technology that's going to be backing games? How is that going to change as well to be able to support those kinds of end game experiences we're thinking about? So I want to start by introducing something which is really quite mad. Um, and we call it the multiversal self. It's the idea that in, in the future, you and I are going to be living in more than one world than once. You know, you're going to be living in this world, but you're going to be interacting in different environments in different places. And those places you go and you interact in, you'll ascribe as much meaning inside those worlds as you do the, the real world. And this may sound far-fetched, but if you speak to somebody who plays the role of a CEO inside a corporation in the game EVE Online, and you ask them, you know, did the experiences they have in that world contribute towards you know, their development as a, as, as a human being, they would certainly say you know, that the things that happen in that world are equally as important. So this is kind of what really we're striving for and improbable, is the idea of an authentic virtual world, a place which actually is meaningful, where your actions in those worlds have real consequences. And this kind of rhetoric is stuff you may be familiar with on you know, the, the back of some uh, video games you may have read. But it's really been something we've never really quite seen. Either you see games that are very much orientated around a narrative where the, the designers of the games have kind of laid out a story, almost like a choose-your-own-adventure book. Or you see sandbox games where you can kind of mess around and, and kind of play with the, the simulations going on there, like a game like sort of a GTA. But there's never any lasting consequence. You know, there's never a reason to really consider what you're doing because the game session is, is ultimately transient. So we started to think about this idea of impossible games, games which traditionally the gaming industry may shy away from uh, due to technical constraints. So this is kind of really our take as we started looking at things, which is we think games technology, although you know, fantastic and is a fantastic area of innovation, is kind of approaching a cliff where if you really want to be enabling those kinds of next generation game experiences, we want to create actual worlds people can like, live inside of, we're going to have to start to actually change the way we think about building games. Um, and we change the way of like, how we get around some of the issues we find building games today. So what kind of things are we looking to achieve? We're looking to achieve, I guess, what we consider these three kind of big pillars which make up um, these kind of end game games. One of them is massive scale. Um, it's the idea that if you really want to have environments which can have, like, you know, look behind you at how many people are, are out here, you're going to have to have technology that can deal with thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people all in the same virtual environment, all at the same time, all interacting with one another. You're going to want to have persistence. As I said before, you know, if your actions don't have consequences that last for you know, perhaps years at a time, how can you kind of derive that sense of meaning? Um, and that's a really important aspect as well. And the, the final piece is, is rich simulation. So I'm not talking about the visual fidelity of games. And I'm sure those of you who kind of play games will see you know, the visual fidelity of them have been ramping up considerably for decades. It's about the, kind of the nature of what's behind that visualization, the AI which is powering the creatures inside of the world. It's the physics which is you know, like sort of driving the interactions of objects. And that needs to reach a certain level of complexity as well for you to really kind of feel immersed and engaged in them. So this is where we want to talk about Spatial OS. So Spatial OS is our games cloud platform, which we've been developing for the last couple of years. And we took some technical choices along the way, which we think are aligned with this kind of game vision we want to enable. So this is what you'll traditionally find today if you were to build an online game. It's you know, a, a client-server architecture. It's the idea that if I'm playing a game like PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds, really big fan, love the chicken dinners, you're going to be connecting to a server when you play that session. And that server is a piece of code running either in the cloud or running in some data center. And all the different clients are going to go ahead and connect into that server. And this works really well um, until you kind of want to 
grow what that world is capable of. If you want to increase the amount of people inside that world, maybe you know, beyond 150 or to 100 in, in Battle Royale games to thousands or tens of thousands, that poor server is going to fall over in terms of networking load. And similarly, if you want to increase the computational fidelity, you want to add rich physics, you want to add rich AI going on inside of that world, again, you're going to hit limits in terms of the computational power of that single server. So Spatial OS's core idea is to not just leverage the power of a single server, but leverage the power of a cluster of machines all cooperating together to simulate a world much bigger than any single server could deal with. And it kind of sits in between clients. So clients connect into Spatial OS, and then the game engines that traditionally would drive a game world um, connect into Spatial OS as well. And because Spatial OS itself isn't a single server, it's a distributed system, we can bring to bear more computation and more networking capabilities than you know, the previous architecture could deal with. And the latency added is pretty much negligible. So why is it called Spatial OS? It's kind of because it's spatial. The, the way you chop up a world, which is absolutely huge, is break it down into different subspaces, all of them overlapping together, stitching together to form a massive world. So this sounds like a really cool idea. And what I wanted to do uh, for the next couple of slides is really elaborate what we think are the kind of technical foundations underneath this that make this possible, and how we think they are necessary to achieve this kind of big goal, which are these massive living worlds we want to be existing in. So the first thing we did is we went back to the drawing board in terms of traditional cloud infrastructure. And we thought about how is that going to be appropriated to be able to create these kinds of games. So this is one thing which we found is, you know, if you think about the public clouds available today, of course, they have you know, the low-level computers you need to be able to make, make up these worlds. But the higher-level concepts they give you, the idea of like um, AWS Lambda and th these kinds of things, they're really orientated around serving um, the use case of web apps and mobile apps. They're really orientated towards request response, having like an app on your phone and just like receiving some data. They're not really orientated towards the kinds of worlds where you have 100,000 people who are all in the same physical world with data updating not just every couple of seconds, like a, when you get a message on WhatsApp, but every single object in the world you're seeing updating maybe 100 times a second. So we really kind of like stepped back and we thought to ourselves, if we were to build a cloud platform for games, what would the base level concept be? It, it wouldn't be a server. It's, it's too low level. So we came up with this idea of a, a world. So when you think about developing inside a spatial OS, you don't think about different servers and what those servers are doing. You think about this abstract three-dimensional space called the world. And inside that world contains entities. And these entities can represent absolutely anything you want. So they could represent players moving around the environment. They could represent AI moving and interacting with things. Even something as simple as a rock on the floor can be represented as a persistent entity. And unbeknownst to the developers, this is using as few or as many servers as is necessary to store all the data that kind of makes up that world in memory so it can be accessed super fast. And these entities consist of components, which are different like, layers that make up that entity. So when I think about a monster, I think of it not as just a monster, but it's something which is a rigid body. It, it, it can physically interact with things. It's a navigator, so it can decide to plan and move around an environment, and probably has some AI as well. And this kind of uh, vocabulary, if you're a game developer right now, you may be quite familiar with the idea of entities and components from game engines like Unity and Unreal. And we deliberately chose this. We wanted to choose concepts which had a natural match with existing games technologies, but allow them to kind of scale beyond a, a single server. And I've just talked right now about the data that makes up the world. But of course, you want that world to do things. You want there to be interactions. You want the creatures to be able to run around and, and, and like sort of interact with other things. And this is where the idea of a worker comes in. A worker is essentially like a spatial microservice. It's a bit of code which runs in the cloud and is responsible for simulating a, a portion of the environment. So you can see in this slide here, you have you know maybe one physics worker is simulating the physics for one area of the world, and you have different kinds of workers simulating different layers of that simulation. And what happens when you actually step back is this is kind of what it looks like. So this is a couple of hundred workers all overlapping together. Each dot is a single worker, and the boundary around them is the area they're simulating. 
and almost like a patchwork quilt, they all stitch together to simulate a world hundreds of times bigger than any single server could deal with. This game world itself is about 36 by 36 kilometers. So this is showing all the different pieces moving. This is all kind of abstract data representation of the world and what's going on across many computers. And then you're going to see progressively enhanced visual fidelity in terms of showing what you actually see when you're a player. So this is showing you know, a, a fairly basic visualization of that world. And then this is showing it in a way which you might be familiar in a kind of more traditional AAA games experience. But these things are ultimately just views onto this kind of abstract data world, which is being streamed down to your client and visualized. And it's worth saying that these game worlds are so large that your client could never actually view the entire thing. It would get completely overloaded. So a really important challenge of Spatial as well is working out exactly what you need to see as you move around the game environment and streaming it down to you super fast. So one of the things I wanted to elaborate on for a little bit is this idea of a world data plane. It's the idea of having an idea of your game distinct of any game engine, distinct of any visualization. And why is it necessary? Games these days, when they're successful, they don't just last for years, they last for decades. And these games have to run on platforms that haven't even been invented yet. Like, you think about Minecraft being invented you know, just over 10 years ago, and I remember seeing a demo of it with HoloLens. HoloLens didn't exist when Minecraft was created. So how do you create a game which can actually evolve through all those different changes? Another aspect as well is you, know, you want to have these deep, meaningful worlds, but you also want to continue developing your game after it's launched. Early access is a really you know, fantastic way of getting game ideas out into the open. But if you want to modify your game code, how about all those save games? How about all those persistent interactions we've been talking about, which are meaningful to people? How do you keep them along for the ride as well? How do you have it so the actions you made in a game five years ago persist, even though the game itself is drastically different? And this is kind of what we introduced, which is a, a data layer, which lets you describe you know, ideas within the game world. So this describes the idea of flammability, the idea that things in the world can catch fire. And you can modify that in a backwards compatible way as you're developing your game over many years. And you can always load like the previous representation of that. And this is like, a really important concept, because you, if you end up adopting a single game engine or you end up adopting like, sort of a particular client to view things, you're going to get trapped in when a new kind of thing comes along, like AR or VR or who knows you know, what beyond. So this is a really important aspect as well, which is around seamless and serverless worlds. So those of you who might not play many games may think that games are this today. They're these huge environments which millions of people are playing. But actually, the way they're implemented is usually you get batched up into small groups, usually around you know, 10 people in size, up to a couple of hundred or maybe 1,000 if it's an MMORPG game. And going back to kind of our original like, sort of, uh, vision of what we want to enable, we want to be able to have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people inside the same environment. So this idea of having the world be seamless, being able to walk around an environment where there's lots of computation, more than a single server working on it at the same time, is super important. So this is a demonstration of a game uh, with a group we've been partnering with called Bossa Studios. And it's a large exploration game where you play the role of these wandering tribes, which go, they chop down trees, they build ships out of physical parts, and they fly around in a 36 by 36 kilometer world containing thousands of individually unique and crafted islands. And this game world is so vast and so computationally intensive. Like Every single panel on that ship you see there is an entity, which I described before, which can land on the ground and just stay there for potentially even years. You need to have a way of being able to get into one of those ships, see an island maybe 5, 10 kilometers away and fly there. If you have a loading screen, if, you, if that's just a billboard, you're going to really break that immersion and, and break the, kind of, the feeling that it's actually a real place. So the picture I introduced before of the workers is actually an early version of Worlds Adrift, and this is showing the different worker allocations. Um, each one of those workers is simulating around about a dozen islands in a kind of patchwork quilt kind of pattern. But as a player, you're actually going to be you know, moving between those different servers completely seamlessly as you play that game. And the kind of technical underpinnings of that are very analogous to 
if you're on a train and you're kind of phoning somebody and you'll find, you know, every now and again, you maybe you get a kind of a stutter as you move from cell phone tower to cell phone tower. The algorithms we've applied here are kind of very similar and they can be applied to any kind of gaming experience. And this is like really, I guess you can tell by, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out when you're on a train, <laughs> you're, on, uh, you're speaking to somebody and it cuts out. This is a very hard problem. Trying to make a seamless interaction when there actually are seams is uh, one of the fundamental things we've been working on. But what it means is, you know, if you achieve this, you can have, you know, hundreds or even thousands of different processes cooperating together to make incredibly rich gaming experiences. So I want to spend the next couple of minutes really thinking about the next like, sort of, uh, few years for us, because we spent a bit of time talking about you know, a very, very big high-level vision, which is like a 10-year vision. And I want to talk about kind of what we're doing right now and the partners we're working with right now. Ultimately, Improbable makes some great stuff, but it's a technology company. And the missing piece is really partnering with different game studios and different people who share this vision for what we want games to be. We think the games industry is just at the beginning of it transforming into something fundamentally different, not just a place for entertainment, but a place where people are going to be actually be spending their lives. And we've been partnering with many different studios all over the world who share this vision and kind of working with them to think, you know, taking their IPs and taking the kinds of games they have, what's the kind of next step? So thinking about a Battle Royale game, which is 100 people duking it out, until there's one winner. What if it was 500 or 1,000 people inside that? What if the world, rather than just having players, had rich physical simulation? What if there were wild creatures and animals to track down and hunt? The kind of complexity of interactions and the amount of emergent things that could happen would be super exciting. And that's kind of my ask of you today, is if you feel you share this vision, do get in touch with us. So yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>